Hello, hello, hello. I do apologize. We were supposed to start about an hour ago. We didn't get our work permits from the city, so they delayed us. We got everything in order. We are good to go. Uh, today going to be a little different. We're going to be talking about construction safety with OSHA and SST, fire safety, everything construction related. Today's guest is a great instructor, Limus Forte. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about Limus. I'm going to bring him on, talk about his background. Limus has been a trainer for a couple of decades, very well educated, um, has a master's degree um, from Rutgers, has a bachelor's from um, Morehouse in Georgia, um, trained for the past two decades in construction, OSHA, SST, EPA, and dozens of other safety courses um, related around the construction field. Um, Linus has done tons of outreach with community-based organizations all over New York City, with NYCHA housing, um, with Rikers. Uh, can't wait. We're going to have Linus Forte. Uh, here he is coming through like a wrecking ball. Linus, good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Charles. How you doing? I'm good. I've been stoked. Uh, you know, we were joking around. Um, we were talking a little bit about, you know, doing this for a while. We ran into some permit problems this morning. Um, we finally figured out the glitches in the system. Really glad to have you. Good morning. Well, I'm glad to be here. You know, without no. without a permit, you you can't you can't do the work. So <laughs> you got that's the first first things first. Absolutely right. Just like the job site, you got to get to know the players of the game. You got to know the agencies. Today, it's all about getting to know the training staff. Um, really glad to have you. And I was joking with the owner, Bruce. You know, you were probably one of the first people I really wanted to do this with, um, just with your background and expertise. Um, you have a loving, caring personality. I've been able to kind of sit and listen into some of the training classes. I say you're like a big teddy bear, but you really do care about your students. Um, so really glad to have you. Linus, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from and a little bit about your background? Well, I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, actually. And I kind of, you know, job-wise, career-wise, I just uh, kind of floated toward, you know, East Coast. I uh, landed in Pennsylvania where I had the background in higher education. I was actually assistant director of college admissions there. And um, prior to coming to there, Pennsylvania, I was actually assistant director of financial aid at Bowling Green State University. So okay. I, I do have a higher education background as well. And I guess that's where my interpersonal skills kicked in, you know, being compassionate about helping people succeed and be successful in life, getting to whether it's degrees or awarding them financial aid packages or even admitting them in, 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 in colleges so they can matriculate through and providing various support services to retain them to graduation. Awesome. You know, um, I kind of crunched some numbers. I, I did a little research um, with a couple of different agencies and, you know, and, and I always just kind of ask the question of our students, you know, why do you want to get into construction? And, you know, just kind of looking at the numbers, you know, a lot of people get into construction, obviously because the salary, um, you know, some locations, depending on where you are and the job, you could be making some pretty good money right off the bat, anywhere between 60 to 70,000 to start. Uh, obviously depends on the trade if you're working in demo or electric or um, fire protection and sprinklers and standpipe but um, you know there's so many different jobs one person you know could do on a job site so you know we'll talk a little bit about that today we're going to talk about the type of training on a construction site um, and why people kind of gravitate towards construction a lot of people just like to work outdoors a lot of people like to work by themselves. There's not as much constant supervision. And, you know, at the end of the project, you kind of see the results. You see something tangible. Um, you know, so I always ask this of the instructors that are on here. But what do you think are some common traits to make a good instructor? Well, a good instructor has to come across very high energy, upbeat, enthusiastic, and very passionate about what it is they're doing. I, I typically introduce myself, you know, and I tell them my name is Mr. Forte and training is my forte, which happens to be my last name. Training is my passion. So you, when you when you let them know that this, this is serious, I said, I tell them OSHA, construction work is for smart people. 
not because you can't find a job anywhere else. If you find the right trainer, you know, you get the right training from the right trainer, uh, you have the right attitude. College is not for everybody, okay? But you can be just as successful or even more more successful in a trade. You know, on the construction site, you need a plumber, you need electrician, you need carpenters, you know? So it's all about, you know, what it is in life you want to pursue. And so a good tr- a good instructor, first of all, gets to know his audience immediately. You got to assess your audience so you know who you de- what you're dealing with. You know, some some are more advanced than others. Some have a lot of construction experience. Some have, have none. You know, so you got to let them know, first of all, construction work is, is very dangerous. One of the most dangerous jobs you can get. So you got to let them know. You know, I usually start off by saying, asking them, you know, something about biology, about their body. For example, do you know how many bones you have in your body, Charles? Uh, oof, put me on the spot. 356? Uh, I, I usually I do that on purpose because... Most people don't know. It's been a, it's been a couple of years since you've been in in your science biology class. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Almost like two decades. <laughs> right. So I, I ask them that because I want them to understand why it's so important to wear the appropriate PPE, i.e., PFAS, personal fall arrest system. And a lot of a lot of guys wear the wear the harness, but they don't tie off. And yeah. so that's why we have up upwards of thirty three percent of all construction workers falling to their death in New York City. You know, it's all about location. Also, you mentioned location. Uh, you know, obviously, construction work is very lucrative in, in New York City, more so than probably, you know, most cities in the country. And, um, you know, in addition to the 30 hours of OSHA training, you also have to take the, the 10 hour site safety training as well with DOB. So I mm-hmm. tell them, you know, construction work is very dangerous. By the way, you have 206 bones. So you have 206 reasons to tie off. You know, you don't want to break you know, break 206 bones, right? And um, we got to talk about the physics of a fall. You know, how far can you fall in one second? How far can you fall in two seconds? You can actually fall 64 feet in two seconds, right? So that, when you talk about Isaac Isaac Newton's law of gravity, you know, I give them an example of, you know, how much is the average pipe wrench weigh? Uh, they say about five pounds. I say, how much is the weigh if it falls from 40 feet in the air? Hmm. You know, it's the same same wrench, but the gravity, you know, the velocity, depending on how high it is, you know, it could, if, you, if you're not wearing your hard hat, if you're not wearing the appropriate PPE, you know, that wrench can go right through your skull. You know, so it's like I get them to understand real quick, you know, how important it is to, to grasp. You're not getting this just to get a, a OSHA card. You know, you're getting this to save your life. You know, who goes to work to get sick? Do you go to work to get sick? No. Do you go to work to get hurt? No. no. Do you go to work to die? No. About 10 to 12 construction workers die every day on a construction site somewhere in America. So, you you know, you got to stress that early on in the class and let them know this is serious. This is your livelihood. This is possibly could save your life or prevent you from getting sick, hurt or dying. You know, you know, I'm glad you bring that up because um, as I was preparing for this, you know, I kind of wanted to take a little bit, you know, from everything. And, you know, you just talked about something so important about injuries and, and fatalities on job sites. So, you know, I'm going to show you some numbers here on, you know, Construction Sites Bureau of Labor Statistics. In 2022, there were 2.6 million non-fatal injuries throughout the United States. Um, to me, that's just amazing, right? Because you have so much training that an individual must take to work on a construction site yet we still have these injuries and i always think it goes back to the knowing doing gap right a lot of people know these things that they have to do but you know they kind of fail to do them um you know big numbers when we talk about you know fatal work related injuries in 2022 um a little over 5,000 across the united states and that's just insane um guys really have to take this training seriously but as you just said right it's meant to keep the worker safe when you get up you have to have that safety mindset you know going in you know i, I always like to joke and um you know have a little bit of fun in class and i say why did the scarecrow get an award at the construction site you know because he was outstanding in his field you know so i bring humor into this uh, i know that you do as well 
you know, kind of gets people giggling and chuckling and, and out of their mm -hmm. shell. Um, but there are so many different types of training um, on a construction site. So if you're talking fire safety, you know, there's a ton of different fire guard licenses one can have. Um, S12 for the sprinklers, S13 for the standpipes. But if you kind of want to work your way up into kind of like managing a construction site, the S56, which we do, is a great way to do it. The S56 is required um, for construction sites in New York City. Very popular. Um, one day class, then you go to the fire department and take the computer-based exam. You know, you started to talk a little bit about this. So we'll jump right into it right now. Um, OSHA, what is it? Who needs it? Why do they need it? Linus. So if you want to do construction work, especially in New York City, you're required to take 30 hours of, of training. Um, initially, it was only 10 hours. Mm -hmm. And obviously, with the, with the numbers that you just indicated, and even more so years ago, you know, they felt that that 10 hours was merely an introduction. They obviously needed more training because too many, too many construction workers were getting hurt and dying, falling to their death. So you need 30 hours of training if you want to do any kind of construction work. Um, and you need the other additional 10 hours, uh, you know, because you're working in New York City. In New York City, the Department of Buildings requires the other 10 hours. So it's all about having the right certification. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the certification implies that you've you set it in a, in a in a well. You've taken thirty hours of training, and you're less likely to do something stupid that's going to cause you to get sick, injured, or die. You need to get the buy-in, on first of all, on why why you need to wear PPE. You know what? For example, what what type of dust do you not want to inhale on a construction site? Definitely don't want silica. That stuff will right. do damage. Um, when you're cutting up wood, you don't want wood. Asbestos. Asbestos. Oh yeah, asbestos. Mm -hmm. Kind of important. Don't want that in your body. <laughs> yeah, and, and lead, lead dust. You know, if, you, lead. If, you, if you're working in the, on a building that was built prior to 1978, you got to assume that you know if they're doing any kind of renovations or demolitions, you're gonna you could possibly inhale lead. So that's lead, asbestos, silica. You know, you can end up with silicosis. You can end up with asbestosis or lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and all those will cause adverse health effects, primarily you know with your lungs. So you don't want that. So you, therefore, you know, if your job requires you to wear a respirator, the first thing you got to do is get a medical evaluation from your doctor. You may mm -hmm. or may not be able to do that particular job on a construction site. You may have to do something else, you know. So you need to get the buy-in on why it's important to wear certain PPE, whether it's a respirator, whether it's a what I call a PFAS, personal fall arrest system, you know, whatever it is, even gloves. You know, you need to know when and when not to wear gloves. I, I, like that, shoes. I, I, I like that you talk about, you know, the equipment as well. You know, like I got my safety vest on me. So, you know, <coughs> I, see. I, 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 see. I have a, a safety vest and my hard hat. I'm good. There's a lot Absolutely. more to it on the job site. A highly visible reflective vest. You're working mm -hmm. at night. People need to see you. Yeah. You know, I, I ride a Harley Davidson. So when I'm riding at night, I put on my vest, you know, because the people need to see you and they need to hear you. So I even changed the pipes on my Harley Davidson. I want people to hear me. So they kind of loud. I didn't do that to be obnoxious. I did that because I wanted them to hear me as well as see me. <laughs> you know, so. you know, I want to kind of jump in and talk a little bit about, you know, the different training that you provide. Talk a little bit about your background because, you know, we, we do a lot at Guardian with security guard training, self-defense training, fire safety, CPR, first aid. I mean, we do it all. Um, but you know, I always say like, you are the encyclopedia, you are the Bible, you are like the OSHA compliance part. Um, and you do a lot of different training. So, you know, one thing I'd like to kind of kick this off with is to kind of just see why were you interested, um, in becoming an instructor, you know, tell us a little bit about your background, the type of things that you did to become an instructor to teach others. Well, in 2004, I, um, I landed a job at New York City Housing Preservation and Development. That's like NYCHA's sister agency. Mm -hmm. And I worked in the lead division. It was called Housing Education Services. So we taught everything from uh, building management, you know, obviously lead awareness. Are you familiar with childhood lead poisoning? Yes. You know, so as you know, landlord, uh, 
NYCHA is probably the largest landlord in the, in, in the country, or certainly the largest landlord in New York City, uh, so much so that I don't even know, can't even count how many projects or housing developments there are in New York City. But it's a lot. And unfortunately, <coughs> NYCHA is probably the, the largest violator of lead poisoning, of lead hazards. So as the senior management trainer for the housing preservation and development, uh, the, the lead division particularly, uh, my job was community awareness. You know, so we did a lot of free workshops actually right across the street at, at Borough Hall. Okay. Um, and um, that was back then. It's no long, they're no longer free now, but we took top classes in building management, how to write. I used to teach the code enforcement inspectors on how to write violations. You know, I actually, um, my staff, I had a staff and we had to take the federal exam, which is a very rigorous, difficult exam. And so my staff at the time, <laughs> I chuckle now because they were they were younger than me. They were like um, at least 10 years younger than me. So I said, wow, what if all my staff passes the exam and I flunk? Can't have that as their supervisor. So, you know, we put together a team and I said, Charles, you're going to have chapters one through five. You're going to become an expert. You know, Bruce, you're going to take chapter six through 11. And everybody becomes an expert. Then we pull everything together and mm -hmm. write up a manual. And that will increase the likelihood of everybody passing. So I kind of fell into teaching at, at my job and then they they afford me an opportunity they actually um had me take an osha class where i i you know i was a student in an in a osha class and i got my osha 10 and um one of my colleagues taught osha and he he strongly recommended he said Lymus, you should really consider because we all had to give a presentation in the class and i gave mine on ppe or whatever it was and you know i was i was pretty i, I was you know i'm I was pretty good at it. So he said, you, you might want to consider being an instructor. It's, 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 uh, it was supplement your income and uh, you might enjoy it. And so I took the test. I invested in the money, passed. It was a two or three day course in, at Rutgers University. And I've been teaching OSHA since 2004, 2005. Very nice. But Very I kind of nice. fell into OSHA from teaching, you know, doing community outreach and, and, and community awareness uh, on lead lead paint the dangers and adverse self effects of lead for kids primarily under the age of six um you know you may or may not know uh because you you don't have any kids yet right but when you have your first kid even even grandpa over here mr weiss um, <laughs> <laughs> you got to make sure that his daughter have the kid tested for lead at yeah. the age of six months and then once again at the age of two so if they have what we call an elevated blood lead level in their body, you can, you can monitor it and make sure it goes down and not up. Hopefully it doesn't have any, any lead in their body because we have, we have other metals in our body. You know, we got iron, zinc, you know, magnesium. One of my students actually told me we had a little, little um, we got copper, we got gold, you know, so um, I kind of fell into OSHA from teaching, uh, teaching about lead, lead awareness to the New York City community. Nice, very nice. I think for me, I became an instructor roughly 2012, 2013, um, because at the time I was working for a private um, guard company. You know, they were taking on the contract for for World Trade, so you know I was going to be the safety guy there. So I had to become a site safety manager, and I also had to take the S56. So I had to do a ton of training, and I said. You know, if I'm going to be giving these orientations, why not go through the OSHA program? I, too, went through Rutgers. They have a great program. I believe probably one of the best if you want to become an instructor. Um, and it's funny. My presentation was actually on silica, but we broke it up the same way. Everybody became a little expert on their fields. We kind of shared information as well. Um, but that instructor training class, if I remember correctly, <coughs> about a week long um, but a lot of fun um, you really dive deep into the stuff but it's funny you say that because i'm going to echo a lot of the stuff that you're saying it seems when you go home right the job's done you're safe but you might bring those dangerous particles um you know to your home as well absolutely um, you should never 
for example, you should never wash your your work clothes with your family's laundry because you can actually bring contaminate their you know your, your family's laundry. You should wash your clothes separate and apart. And ideally, if, if if at all possible, you should try to wear a Tyvek suit or whatever, depending on what you're doing, so that you can just take that off, and and uh, you know not not have your clothes exposed to your family's clothes. Um, so yeah, it's very important because you can bring home silica dust asbestos dust lead dust and you don't you don't want to bring that so some contractors actually realize that they have poisoned their own children because yeah. what's the first what's the first thing your kids do when when daddy comes home from work they want to hug you, right? yeah jump right on you yeah right right and you have you feel you you feel you full of dust regardless of what it is it's it's not a good not good and it doesn't take a whole lot of lead dust to poison a child a kid that actually has too much lead in their body has to undergo immediate medical treatment called chelation therapy that's to get in order to get the bad mineral out of the body they have to strip it strip all of it out it's like almost like um what if, if you're a diabetic you have to uh what is it called um, insulin shots yeah but you have to um dialysis it's like Stand dialysis yeah you got to strip out take everything out and put everything that's supposed to be in you know because the, the kid's body is still developing it doesn't differentiate you know what's copper what's zinc what's magnesium it's just saying give me more give me more because i'm still developing and calcium actually mimics lead you know so it's not good so yeah. this is why it's important to have the kids tested for lead <clears throat> it's supposed to be automatic but we have found especially in the underserved communities that it's not automatic it's just like it's not automatic if you and i go in and we want an hiv exam if we don't ask for it we don't yeah. get it yep right it's so true you gotta really you know fight and ask for the things that you need and want um so a lot of people you know they have that conception or misconception you know i just need an osha 30 and my sst and i go on a job site and that's it uh, but there are so many like hidden dangers around every corner and not to make the job seem scary but you know we'll talk about osha's focus for um in just a few minutes mm -hmm. but uh i would love for you to just talk a little bit about your previous work history um to prepare you for a role because you know i got your resume here i looked over it but uh, man you've done a lot my friend you've done a lot yeah actually i can't put everything on my resume it actually makes me look bad it makes me look like i never knew what i wanted to be when i grew up <laughs> and so so it might it might look impressive but it doesn't it doesn't show any stability uh because i was i was jumping all over the place and uh, uh it's, that's good and it's bad i, I had an excellent career uh, but I never stuck and stayed anywhere for any length of long length of time. So, but yeah, I, um, everything I even sales, I got a sales background mm -hmm. in sales. Um, I sold home improvements. I sold everything on a house. I sold everything, but the house, I actually took a real estate class, but I never, never took the exam. But if I'm in your house trying to sell you a $20,000 roof, you know, I might be in your house for a couple of hours, but if I sell you a $20,000 roof, I make a pretty decent commission, but that same, you know, that same roof can somebody else can sell it to you for for twelve grand. So my job was to explain to you why you should convince you why you should buy it from me, and not from not from Charles. I said, you know, so Charles, what's the what's the what's the market value of your house? You know, you might tell me half a million dollars, right? I said, so yo, your house is worth five hundred thousand dollars. And you, you you don't want to invest twenty thousand dollars to the most important part of your home and probably you know i would i would embarrass them in front of their wife <laughs> you know I, I say take me to your attic let me see your crawl space and if i see any stains or but my point is you got to get you know but when i come in your house you know we, we call it a warm-up you know i'm looking at i see your m16s or whatever i'm like oh wow you're a hunter you know i look for things that i can start a conversation to try to get you to forget while i'm there you know and before i lay the boom on you you know and um you can so the thing is you got to get them to like you people yeah. buy from you because they like you and we call it in business we call it abc's I always be closing so you're closing from the time you don't get a second chance to make a first impression so you know you got to, in, in, in addition to whatever product you're selling you got to sell yourself first absolutely true right you know when, when um i was preparing for this right you know i got your resume and i and i would Literally, if I had to do like a one sentence to describe you to a, a student is somebody who really uh, knows how to get 
information a- across in an easy, digestible uh, manner. Because I know that you do some stuff for for bed bug awareness, um, asthma triggers, pest management. Um, you really have taken and know every little aspect about a construction site or an individual's home. How did you get started with that? Again, that was through HPD. You, know, you call you, you could you call three one one and they have a problem. It could be heat and hot water. You know, um, do you know when heat and hot water season is or what it is? Oh you know? man, put me on the spot. Uh, train the trainer for Mister McNamara. Is it April fifteenth right. through October fifteenth? You're close. Yeah, May. May. Yeah, that's around there. If the temperature on the outside is less than what forty degrees, the temperature on the inside has to be at least fifty five. Yep. And a lot of senior citizens thought 55 was still kind of cold. Yeah. But they're like, you know, they're compliant. They're compliant if it's at least 55. It's got to put some blankets on or some sweaters or something. But, you know, mm-hmm. then there's, um, um, you know, we, we talk about mold. We talk about um, the lead. You know, every every year, if, you, if you're a housing resident, NYCHA resident, you get a notice asking you, do you have a kid under the age of six for peeling paint? Or do you have a kid under the age of 10 for window guards? You have no clue how many kids fall out of windows in the summertime. And you know what you know what it is? They hear that ice cream truck. You know, yeah. so mommy and daddy gets home and they're cooking. They got their back turned. The kids cr- claws up on the chair to the table, to the window, because he hears that ice cream truck. And if they don't have a window guard, they fall out. I mean, you, you if I knew because I worked for them, but you, you can see this, this binder of all these kids that die every year, every particularly in the summer, from that ice cream truck. It, it's an interesting article. I didn't print it out for um, today, but if you go to the city's website, you're actually able to kind of you know pull the facts and pull the numbers from a lot of this information that you're talking about today. And then I remember, I mean, growing up, you know, you heard a lot of incidents of kids falling out of the windows, which kind of led to that law, or you know, they would try to push themselves through the air conditioner side where they can, wherever they can stick their head out. Um, yeah, pretty dangerous, scary stuff there. Yeah, so we taught, I taught carbon monoxide. For instance, why is carbon monoxide considered the silent killer? It's odorless, it's colorless, it's not irritant. You know, mm-hmm. you, you can be exposed to carbon monoxide and not know it. And then it, you know, and then you, you fall asleep forever, <laughs> right? And um, so we taught do you know the national time uh, to change your your um, the battery in your smoke detector or your carbon monoxide detector? Seventy so six months. No, actually, when the time goes back or up, when the daylight okay. savings time, and it's like a, a national reminder. You know gotcha. what happens around Thanksgiving or the holidays? You're cooking, and it goes off. And what do you do? You take you pull the battery out because you get tired of that annoying sound, and then you eat. And you get itis and you forget to put it back. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it's kind of a national reminder when the time goes up or, or back to to look at to check all your all the batteries in your in your carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. So, you know, it's things like that. We taught we taught bed bugs, you know, mm-hmm. you know, do you know you can't throw a mattress away unless you wrap it? If you don't wrap it, you can get a you can get a ticket. You get big fines for that now, yeah. You get a big fine, you know, so people need to be aware of that, you know. Um, and it's, it's actually, you should do more than that. You should destroy it because you have these trucks coming around at, at night, picking those mm-hmm. up and, and real poster them or whatever. And yeah. you're, you're, you're spreading the bed bug, uh, infest, you know, around the, around the city. And that's not good. So those, those are, the, again, some of the free classes that I taught at HPD. Uh, and, you know, obviously led to to my interests and and i enjoy empowering people educating people you know we say knowledge is power and then when i can increase your marketability you know to increase the likelihood of you landing a job you know i certify people that means i help people get jobs i recertify people i have people keep their jobs so i feel pretty in addition to the monetary compensation for doing that i get a little inner fulfillment knowing that i'm i'm helping people you know i've 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 been i've I teach at Rikers. So I taught at Rikers. And one yeah. time I was I was in Harlem and I was actually on my lunch break, coming from my lunch break, headed back to one of the housing developments. And I'm walking one way and the student, a previous student of mine was walking the other way. 
the opposite direction. And we both turned around because we recognized each other. And he, you know, this big guy, tall guy, he embraced me and he said, Mr. Forte, oh man, you changed my life. He was one of my Rikers students. He showed me, went in his wallet, he showed me his his employment ID, he showed me his bank card where he had a bank account. He said, Mr. Forte, you changed my life. Thank you so much. And it was, you know, it was it was very emotional actually, because you know, I can't save everybody, but you know, if I if I'm able to if you know talk about this and and and, and ex- expound on some success stories, I feel like I'm I'm making my contribution to society. <laughs> I'm giving you know, back I- a little bit. I was just about to say, I know besides some of the community-based organizations that you help and train and working with the city that you also work with um, Rikers as well. Um, and you've done some crisis prevention, right? Because you want to try and help as many people, um, as, you know, before something happens. But your skill set is so amazing. Like I always say, it's kind of like a three-prong approach where, you know, you're helping people just kind of maybe get into the workforce. You're helping individuals who are on job sites and also helping people who might have been displaced get back into the workforce. So kudos to you, man. You really have done a little bit of everything for everybody. And I think that's a valuable thing to help people reach their goals. And I think that's a sign of a good instructor. Um, Everybody that I've talked to, the main reason they teach is to help people, right? You get a salary, obviously, right? But... The main goal is to help people along the way. I, I would love to know for you, Linus, who has been the most positive influence in your career uh, and why? Well, it's one of my supervisors who, who actually was, was a friend of mine. I actually moved back to Ohio from New York. And because uh, this particular friend knew my background, she called me maybe two or three months after I had moved back to Ohio and said, and, and told me about this career opportunity. I said, where were you two or three months ago? I just moved back to Ohio. She <laughs> said, if I was you, I moved back to New York. And she told me what the job was. That's the senior management trainer. She said, this, this job has your name on it and blah, blah, blah. And she was right. And then that's how I ended up becoming an instructor. <clears throat> that's how I ended up teaching lead. That's how I ended up teaching OSHA. So I, I would have to say she's been the most, you know, you know, the person that influenced me the most. And, um, you know, she's still my friend. <laughs> it, it's good, you know, to have a leader. And, and I got something I'm going to share in a few minutes that, that you shared with me. Um, you know, there's so many people, I think, in this world that just really want to be a beacon of light. And it, I think it's our obligation as instructors or trainers or managers or senior leadership. We have to help people up, right? We never look down on anybody unless we're trying to help them up. Um, you know, and it's good to have somebody by your side backing you up. Um, you know, there's so many new things that are out there with technology, with codes, with laws and regulations. Um, you know, I lose track of all this stuff. I, I have a couple of things that I pin to my website and I save it on my browser just if I need to look up something or if there's a new local law, an industry change, something that changes on, on OSHA's website. But how do you stay up to date with the trends um, in the construction industry? Well, as you just mentioned, you know, they're, you know OSHA has a website and they, they're constantly keep, keeping you apprised of, you know, of new, new rules and regulations. And a good instructor, you need to be constantly, you know, aware uh, if there's anything new so you can present new information to your students. So whether it's the website or whether we get we get annual, we get weekly newsletters or monthly newsletters, uh, we have to recertify ourselves as trainers every four years again because the rules and regulations change, you know. So and then I've been in this business for a long time, so I have other colleagues. We try to keep each other informed um, if there's a new, you know, for, for example, now I'm considering going, <coughs> getting my certification to become a asbestos instructor um, because I've, I've found that that's uh, becoming increasingly uh, lucrative. People mm-hmm. are asking me, do, do I teach asbestos? And I'm like, I teach asbestos awareness, but I don't teach, you know, the advanced courses. Mm-hmm. And so I'm considering that. I'm actually considering becoming uh, uh, 
learning the site safety management job. You know, that's um, that you had indicated that you were a site safety manager at one time. Yeah. Oh man, bringing back uh, a lot of fun work and study nights. Um, 6 a.m. You know, going to work, getting out at 6 p.m. and then literally training. You know, for 40 hours nonstop. Um, but yeah. you know, like like you say, there's so many different opportunities. Today's day and age, you know, there's so many different ways to learn. You know, with Guardian, you know, we're approved to do training online, and I'd love to get your feedback on this. Um, everybody kind of learns differently. You know, some people are visual. You show them something and they get it. You put on a video, maybe they understand. Somebody's auditory, like they hear it. They might listen to a podcast like this on their way to work, and something clicks, or they're, um, you know, they're, they're they like to read, or they're kinesthetic. They got to put their hands on stuff. I think a lot of construction training um, lends itself to both. Some of it you can do online. Some of it is best served in person. Uh, I'd love to get to know your thoughts on in-person versus online training. Well, I'm a strong advocate, obviously, for bias reasons for the in-person training. Um, it's just that, um, you know, hands down, in-person training, uh, you get you have more control with the of, over the class. It's more structured. Um, uh, the you know, I like to I like students to be engaged. People like to like you said they like to touch, they like to see, they like to hear. You know, so I I have all most of my students. I actually anybody in the class who, who's never put on a PFAS before, and I actually bring yeah. a harness and a lanyard. I bring everything to class. And I said, the, the, what you don't want to happen to you is on your first day on the job site, your, your supervisor, Charles, will tell you to go, go in that basket and get a harness, go get a PFAS, and you're looking at it like you don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to put it on. <laughs> I said, so this is your training. You know, this is this is when you want to look, you know, great, stupid or whatever, uh, but not, not your first day on the job because if you look that way on your first day, day on the job, nobody's going to want to work with you. And say, look at that. Look at that clown. Don't even know how to put on a, a PFAS. So if you yeah. don't know how to do that, what else don't you know how to do? You know, so I, 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 I you know, but everybody can't can't come to class, you know, yeah. so I think it's good to have options, you know, but if I had to choose one or the other, I, it, it would be in person class hands down. And, and I, I'd love to take this opportunity to share the pictures you sent with me. You had hundreds of, mm -hmm. you know, students. Yeah, that I, 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 was, I did that on purpose. You asked me <laughs> for some pictures several times. I'm like, I'm going to flood them with pictures until he tells yeah. me to stop. <laughs> and, and one thing I got to say, right, I don't have a, a, an hour to share every single one, but yeah. out of the hundreds of pictures that you sent, everybody looks engaged and everybody's smiling. So I'm going to show the picture. Um and talk a little bit about this class. Yeah, that was a class for this uh, not-for-profit organization that I actually used to work for. A class called uh, organization called We Act. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the, that organization uh, is a strong advocate for um, the underserved communities in Upper Manhattan, um, and that's where I did a campaign, a lead campaign, a bus campaign, uh, in, uh, informing people about the adverse health effects of lead and. And um, you know, getting the kids tested and things of that nature. But this um, this was a class on on 155th in, in Amsterdam, and it was it was about 25 students. And um, you know, again, they they love coming up, putting on the PFAS, and I would tell them, I would just watch them, and they would ask me, how do you do this? I'm like, I'm not telling you. You tell me. I said, this is my whole point was I wanted them to see how important it was. For them to put that on and you know it's it's like putting on a, a book bag but if you don't know that mm -hmm. you know you, you're gonna look stupid on your first day on, it, on your job so everybody usually at the end of my class you know what they ask me what else do you teach <laughs> because yeah. they want to take another one of my classes you know so yes i usually get everybody engaged and i tell them up front at the beginning of the first day of the class if i don't know your name by the end of the class that's a problem that suggests to me you haven't been engaged, you haven't been asking questions, you know. And if I, you know, if I don't know your name, if I don't, if I can't associate your name, <coughs> who you look like, and, and how you participated in my class, that might be to your detriment, you know. If you need a one, one, one point, if you had a sixty-nine and you need a seventy to pass, you know, I might make the difference. Yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah. I, I think the very first time that I learned how to wear a personal fall arrest system was actually in boot camp. Um, you know, we climb up the walls, you know, 50 feet high, and we got to rappel down. I, I had like no clue. You know, I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. I've never put any of this stuff on. I put it on the same exact way you would a book bag, not realizing that's not the way that this thing goes. But drill sergeant would say, who wants to work with this guy? He's going to get you killed. And it immediately just, you know, kind of snapped on, oh, snap. I need to pay attention. I can get hurt or hurt somebody else um, as well. So you're right. right. So, you know how to wear the right equipment as well. Um, and you got to know how to adjust it. You don't have to clean it. You know, you don't wear yeah. a respirator all day long. Just put it on yourself without cleaning and disinfecting it because you got to put it on it the next day. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, so if I give you PPE and you don't know how to adjust it properly, it's not going to do its job. It's not going to do what you intend for it to do. You know, so um, it's, it's very important that not only do you provide the PPE, but you give them the training on how to use it and how to maintain it and how to know when it's when it's time to replace it. You know, you wouldn't you. Why would you wear a a lanyard that's frayed? What's going to happen? You know, it's going to snap. And if it snaps, you're going to snap. You know, so, you know, and not only do you need to, t you know, give them the buy in of why it's important to wear it. It's, it's also important to know how to adjust it, when to replace it. You know, for example, how do you know you need to replace the cartridges? What's the difference between a mask and a respirator? Couple of hundred bucks. <laughs> in reality, um, you know, you have to get fit tested. That's a lot of things. Uh, one of the many things I think on a construction site, people think, you know, my my boss gave me this. I'm good to go. It's still your responsibility to make sure that it fits properly um, and it fits to you um, because size differences. Some things you have to be fit. To <coughs> um, one thing is for a certain set of particles. The other might be for another set of particles. Correct. Um, you got to know the proper tool for the job that you're doing. Um, you know, another one I, I think too that you mentioned, um, which we're gonna, you know, hard hats, wearing the right headgear, the safety gear as well. Absolutely. You know, why would you want to wear a hard hat? Why do you want to protect your head? Because that's where your brain is. <laughs> You know, and uh, if your brain stops working, guess what? Everything else stops working. So, you know, it's it's just unacceptable for you not. This, this, this guy got killed in Jersey City. This guy had a, a measuring tape that only weighed a pound, but it fell from 50 stories and killed a man. Why? Because yep. he, he wasn't wearing his hard hat. <laughs> now, even and if he was wearing his hard hat, it may have knocked him out, but it, 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 it probably would have saved his life. You know, so I have a lot of gory videos where the guy drops a wrench and a wrench goes through the guy's skull. And, you know, um, I find those those type of videos are necessary when I'm teaching. It, it hits home, but it, it's the basics. You know, and I always say you have to have a good foundation and understanding. You know, safety is your responsibility, right? Yes, you know, when we get into legalities, the employer has to do training, but safety is everybody's job. You got to make sure you get to work safely and get home safely. It, even uh, something as simple as climbing a ladder, you know, mm -hmm. name two, name two types of ladders. You got your step ladder and you have your extension ladder and they both, you, you got to always face the ladder. You know, uh, you should open it up. Why do you open it up? If it's a step ladder, so it'll look like an A, you don't mm -hmm. lean a, a, a step ladder on a wall. You open it up and you lock the braces. If you can't, then you're using the wrong ladder. If you use an extension ladder, it should extend at least three feet above the landing you're trying to access. And then there's a ratio, the angle. It should be four to one. For every four feet up, the ladder should come out one foot. So there's there's rules to climb the ladder and how to be safe. Most people, <coughs> so, so I asked my class, how many of y'all ever painted before? Everybody raised their hand. I said, did you carry the bucket up with you? You know, when you when you climbed up? <laughs> oh, yes. I carry my bucket and I carry the brush. I was like, yeah, you're not supposed to carry anything up with you when you climb yeah. the ladder. You're not <laughs> supposed to stand on the top of a step ladder. You know, you lose your balance, blah, blah, blah. There's certain rules of, of climbing a ladder that people take for granted until you fall and hurt yourself. You know, so these are all the kinds of things that they, they learn in my ocean class. Simple things I, I, climbing a ladder. I definitely, it's funny you say that, like after taking an OSHA class, I can literally count dozens of infractions, things that I do or will see others do at home, friends and family, just, just totally wrong. 
Um, you know, I know that you've been doing this for a long time and have helped so many people. How many students do you think you have trained over the years as an instructor? Well, I look at my portal when I, after I teach a class and I have to order OSHA cards, Okay. they, they actually give me a count of how many students I trained that year. And so right now I'm at 35, 3,500 or so. Um, but that's this year. And I've been doing this for, you know, what is that? Six, 26, <laughs> yeah, almost 30 years. You carry you know, the zero for, time. Right, right, yeah, yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> you know, so it tells you thousands, thousands. Right. Now you, you brought up um, something. I kind of wanted to jump into this, right? Because I always kind of navigate more towards the guard industry, law enforcement, military training, investigations, right? That's my background, my fun stuff. You hear a lot about these scam schools, right? People, they go to this guy in the corner or they go to the guy in the truck and they pay some money to get a, a certificate. <clears throat> Talk about the actual card process, right? How do they actually get the card? How, how would someone know if it's a valid card or not? Well, that has evolved over the years that I've been in training. It used to just be a, a paper, you know, you can almost make it yourself. Um, but now it looks like a credit card and it has a, um, what's the thing that you scan? What's that called? I, I, oh, QR. QR, a QR code. And you, you scan the QR code and it can tell you, it can tell who's ever looking at it and wants to, you know, to verify that. <clears throat> who your instructor was when did you take the class and whether it's valid or not i've had some students uh come back to bruce and they said that they said the car was not valid and you know we scan it and we find that actually it was um it's just that it, it came from another what we call ato authorized yeah. training organization uh i have my current training certification from mid the mid-atlantic now in maryland mm -hmm. not Rutgers, and okay. so they were saying that the 14 which is Rutgers, you know, on, on my number, on my, on my, my number that they put on my card. And he said, ah, all this, you got, if it does, if it starts with anything other than the 14, it's not valid. Well, <clears throat> that's because most of their people when they work for New York city, took the train at Rutgers or the, the instructor took the train at Rutgers. So, but we found out that was one reason why the card looked like it, it was invalid, but mm -hmm. it, it, that was actually valid. So the QR code looks like a credit card. It's not it's not easy to uh, to copy. If you have this, I've heard some students had said they had their their picture on their OSHA card, I and mean, that's the that's the dead, that's the dead giveaway. Nobody, yeah. you know, you have your picture on your site safety training card now. That's different, you know. Um, but yeah, it's it's become more and more harder and harder to 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 fake. And then if you if you if you know somebody said they only paid a hundred dollars for their card, then you are you you already know. <laughs> You yeah, know, you know, um, there's something fishy about that. I, I always tell people, <laughs> you, you think you might be getting a deal, right? Hey, you know, go to these guys, they'll charge you a hundred bucks. You only got to sit there for an hour. There should be red flags, right? Because sometimes they'll just give you a paper, like, oh, yeah, look, you are good. Right. Here is your ocean Absolutely. card. Absolutely. And then I have students, prospective yeah. students, try to, oh, I'll just I'll just give you $200 and you put me in there. I say, oh, no, 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 no. I want you, first of all, that card doesn't mean anything without the information. Correct. If your supervisor start asking you basic questions and you can't respond, answer them appropriately, first thing they're going to see, well, who is your OSHA instructor? And if you see, if they see Lyman's forte, they're going to know, no, that, that couldn't have been your, your instructor because I know how he gets down. He's yeah. very thorough, blah, blah, blah. And um, so I, I said, no, that um, you got to sit in my class if you want it for me. Quite frankly, I don't want my name on your OSHA card if you don't know the information. Yep. I, I know. It's a reflection on me. Several well. instructors that would not, um, you know, just hand out a card because people are like, oh, you know, I'll pay you four or five hundred bucks. Here you go. And, you know, it's like you said, reputation is important. Most of all of the instructors I've come across, you know, they know their knowledge. They want to help people. And, you know, they got to make sure that they do it the proper way. Because OSHA will go out to job sites. You'll have New York City Department of Buildings on job sites. So a lot of people take it very, very seriously. So we should do it the right way. It's a federal um, certification. Who do you not want to mess with? The feds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<coughs> I know you talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, continuing education, developing your skill sets. Um, I always kind of, you know, have my books right in front of me when I'm going back and forth to work, you know, on the bus and the train. It's like my mobile classroom. Um, but what are some other things that you are taking part in to develop your skill sets? Well, I, I, I try to go to, as, you know, as many classes as possible. I, I believe, I'm a strong believer that you, you should always be learning. You should learn something new every day if possible, at least once a week. Um, so... As I indicated earlier, I'm, I'm probably going to do, a, you know, site safety management course, maybe the asbestos course so I can teach that um, and just stay apprised to to new rules and regulations. Uh, one of my colleagues brought something to my attention about lead. Uh, they, they, they actually lowered the numbers uh, in terms of um, exposure to lead dust for kids. It used to be 10 micrograms uh, per cubic centimeter. Now it's five you know, five micrograms, which is a lot less. If they use the XR gun to test for lead, um, it used to be 1.0 milligram per centimeter square. Now it's a lot less than that. So they're basically saying if there's any lead, the homeowner, the, the, the landlord needs to remediate that lead hazard immediately. And so, uh, so just stand on, because you, you don't want to give, you don't want to teach misinformation. You got to know the new information. So uh, you got to always be uh, you know, looking at the website to see what's new. And usually when you go on the website, they'll tell you right away, this is brand new, newsflash, blah, 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 new rule, new regulation. So if you want to be an effective and current instructor, you, you got to at least visit the websites. I think, you know, you kind of nailed it on the head on um, OSHA's website. Whatever is new, always going to pop at the top. It's a great resource, OSHA.gov. <coughs> Mm. OSHA.gov is a great resource. Um, you know, I kind of wanted to jump into this topic. Um, and I always say, like, this is a sizzle before the steak. Four very important things when we talk about OSHA's focus for falls, struck by incidents, electrocutions, and uh, caught in between or caught between. How would you identify the OSHA focus for? Well, you know, these are the, that's why they call it the focus for accidents on a construction site. This is where OSHA writes the most violations for, the most frequently cited violations. And as you know, number one is falls. And then why are you required to wear a hard hat? Because you can get struck by something. You know, you on a construction site, oftentimes there's excavations. You know, if you're using the excavators, you're excavating, or if you're using a crane, you know, you don't want to get caught in between the swing radius of a crane's bed. We call that the superstructure of a crane. You know, you don't want to get knocked into an excavation because you get caught in between one cubic yard of soil can weigh up to 4,000 pounds, 3,000 pounds. That's like a car falling on you, you know, so caught in between and, um, and struck by electrocution. You know, you got to have electricity on the construction site, you know. <clears throat> who you think gets shocked the most? Well, electricians. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. For some reason, they think they're invincible, but you know, you, you know, that's why you have to have GFCIs, ground fault circuit interrupters. You know, you got to have the extension cords. You got to have everything should be polarized, meaning you get three plugs. You know, we teach basic fundamentals of electricity in the OSHA 30 class because whether you're at home or at work, you need to know have some basic understanding about electricity you know if usually you got a sink in your bathroom and you have an outlet right next to it where you might use your shave to shave or a woman might be drying her hair you know you don't want any water to get into that outlet so where do you have your gfcis usually in the bathroom and the kitchen in the kitchen you got the sink and you might have a toaster or a microwave and so you don't want the water to go into those outlets so that's why you have a gfci so you know it's, it's very important to sort of focus for therefore falls you know we got to talk about the importance of uh when we talk about falls we're not just talking about the construction work of falling we're talking about falling objects hitting the pedestrians as well you know so you got to have the <clears throat> that's actually you got to have three types of fall protection you got to have your guardrail and the guardrail has to be a certain height you know you say 42 inches plus or minus three inches you know you got to have the pfas you got to be connected or you can have the safety net. 
The safety net can be as close as possible, but it can't be no further than 30 feet away. Okay, so you got falls and you got your uh, struck by. Again, you want to make sure nobody gets too close to the, I mean, you want to make sure you're wearing your hard hat. You want to make sure you're wearing your, your safety shoes. And how do you know if they're, they're official? Well, oh. you know, you, you, you got to make sure. Tims, the most expensive Tim's I could get, right? The most well, no, not Tim's. Well, Tim's have stepped up their game because they lost a lot of money because they stopped using Tim's as construction boots. So now they have they now they they, they have actually uh, construction boots with the ANSI label, American National Standard Institute. Um, you know, again, I, I ride a Harley Davidson. I don't want a pebble hitting me in my eye, so I wear ANSI glasses. How do you know if your safety glasses are official? You don't want to go to the ninety nine cent store and buy safety glasses. You want to mm -hmm. make sure they're ANSI approved. How do you know if your respirator is 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 legit? You want to make sure you see HEPA, highly efficient particulate air absorbing filter, right? You want to make sure if it has no writing on it. A lot of employers give the they give their workers that white mask with the little tin thing over the nose. That's garbage. That yep. does nothing to prevent you from inhaling <coughs> the toxic dust, you know. Yep. And uh, so you got to make sure that whatever you put on, as I indicated before, is going to do what you intend for it to do. So those are the top, those are the most frequent violations that OSHA writes up, that they cite. And if OSHA writes it up, they're going to call DOB. If DOB writes it up, they're going to call OSHA. You know, they're, they're in bed together. So yeah. you're going to get more than one, one violation from different agencies. And they will come down and they will shut the job down. Uh, they take it very seriously. You know, uh, I just kind of put some stuff in the chat so people can uh, save that. Um, OSHA, Focus 4, very important. ANSI Safety, okay, and UL Laboratory as well. Um, what other resources would you recommend for students to kind of look into maybe after a class just to kind of help them remain safe on a job site? Well, I actually tell them, be bold, be aggressive. Go to a construction site and show them your credentials. Show them you have your OSHA 30. Show them you have your site safety training. Ask them where's the foreman. You know, <clears throat> you know, construction work is very dynamic. People are coming in and out every day. Yeah. Um, you know, so go to the workforce development offices. You know, makes update your resume. Um, you know, you know the. Usually when I when I before I start a class, I ask everybody to introduce themselves. Tell me why you're in the class, what you know about OSHA. Do you do, you do construction work? Or are you just looking for a job? Mm -hmm. And um, so I get to know who, you know, who's in my class. You know, I've had classes. Um, well, that's another question that you're going to ask me. But I had classes with, you know, just, just students from uh, Rikers. And I've had classes where they were GCs, you know, who own their own construction companies who, who were there. And they was also had had their staff there you know so you know i've gone from the bottom to the top i've yep. taught them all and if obviously if i have electricians or somebody in a particular trade when i get to that particular topic you know i kind of learn from them <coughs> i let them lead the class you know because we all learn from each other mm -hmm. and i think that's important too just so everybody realizes that everybody on a construction site has to have the training it's not just meant for the, you know, the low man on the totem pole. Anybody that steps foot on that construction site is going to need to take that training. Um, Linus, last question. What has been your most memorable class and why? Wow, that's, that's, that's a hard one to find one most memorable class. But I taught a class again in Upper Harlem uh, for this organization called Grant. No, no, actually it was right around the corner from here. BEOC, uh, Brooklyn Educational Opportunity Center on Livingston. And um, I didn't know that they were calling me to teach the class because the pri the previous day, the current instructor that they initially hired couldn't handle the class. So when I get there, I didn't really know that was why I was there. And I just did what I normally do, took control of my class. And so as a result of me taking control, you know, um, they respected me more. Or whatever. I don't know whether it's the other the woman. You know, the, the previous instructor was, you know, she was a woman. And I guess she was maybe soft or whatever. And I came in, you know, strictly business. Mm -hmm. You know, this is an OSHA class. You need to understand the, the value of this class, how important it is. We're talking about your livelihood, your life, your health. 
And, you know, I, I established my class right away. And so I've had students come to me after the class. It's like, wow, Mr. Forte, you don't realize, you know, do you know you were the second instructor that we had? The first one didn't, didn't last because they had a fight. There was an altercation and you came in and you took control and blah, blah, blah. And several of those students came up to me after the class, some of which started their own business <clears throat> and came to me and thanked me for making sure that the class was not canceled. So it's those kinds of things when students come to me and thank me for 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 changing their life, basically. You know, I remember those classes, you know. So this particular class was just right around the corner. And they had about 30 students, and they were, you know, a lot of students, you had these classes where the organization, the community organization pays for the class. Sure. Some of them yeah. take it more serious than others, you know. They had, they take it more if you had to pay for the class, you tend to take it more seriously. But if it's, yeah. if somebody else is paying for the class, then he's like, ah, I'm taking it because it's free. And yeah. I try to weed out those students right away <clears throat> and let them know, you know, you don't have to be in this class. If you want to be excused, I can let you, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, let them know. I don't want no knuckleheads in my class. I want you to learn. If you're not, if you're not here to learn, then I don't really want to teach you. If you if you have skin in the game, you kind of pay attention a little bit more. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Um Linus, I just want to thank you so much, um, you know, for doing this. You were like the first person on my mind. It's crazy how fast these go by. You know, we've hit the hour mark. We always try to hit the sweet spot um, with like an hour. Um, folks, I want to thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, make sure you sign up for an OSHA class. You're going to get this gentleman, uh, Linus, uh, most likely with OSHA and SST. I have all of the information at the bottom in the website listed below, guardiangroupservices.com. This is kind of the start, right? You can take your OSHA training, work your way up to do so much more on a construction site. So Limus, once again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you. The pleasure was all mine. Thanks for inviting me. And folks, comment down below. What training would you like to see in the future? Um, who would you like to see on a podcast? Stay safe. Stay alert on those job sites. Most importantly, be safe. Have a great day.